the mama money back with menace that's the definition of uh, blackmail he got stabbed in the, in the lower back <laughs> was saying that he's got him and it's not gonna go cool the judge summed up said you're disruptive you showed no remorse i'm a danger because of the stuff i've been through and do you not think in a weird way that's you still winning how am i winning when i just got a ten and a half eds i don't feel winning <laughs> what happened on that day or that night i was selling drugs i was with my friend in the pub and he gets a call that his missus has crashed the car. The missus died on the scene. I got there, met them, and as I'm pulling off after, then the blue lights come behind me. Dropped the gear, shot up, and I was in a hundred. I come to the bend way too fast, the bike started to snip. And they like catapulted me flying through the air. And he like turned to me, don't move, and I'm still trying to get away, laying in this ditch, and then. So when you got out, did you think I need to change my life here? What, the first time? Yeah. The same day I was going to pick up drugs. If anything, I, made, I think it made me feel more confident to do it. That, that's the worst you got, cool. Was, was your arm connected to you? I had a massive open fracture, so the bones were sticking out. I'm losing loads of blood, and they left it because waking up with that, it would have been too traumatic. I think they knew from then it was never going to be survived. When you were lying in that ditch, and all you were in that consciousness, did you think you were going to die? So today, we are joined by Chris Bacon. Obviously, you've got one arm. I want to point that out. The reason I want to point that out is you're the only person, the only amputee who spent that long behind the door now the first thing that jumped out to me was the fact that how many people have i saw that have came out of prison and have got one arm and i think that's why i had to get you on the podcast bro because where you're at now is so inspiring but ultimately there's always a backstory there's always something that got someone to that position so talk about you mate where you're from so nice to meet you by the way yeah so i i grew up in enfield i was born in edmonton i lived in enfield uh and yeah i lived there with my mum, just me, my mum. My dad weren't about, didn't really know him when I, from when I can remember. So me and my mum lived there um, for till I was 15. Uh, yeah, that, it, like that's where I was and then I moved to Chesant. But that's basically where my, my childhood was and a lot of events went on through that childhood, yeah. So I kind of want to jump straight in because I feel like if... The average person on the street gets into trouble. It's normally over something petty to start with, and you find that it gets escalated further and further, getting deeper crime. Did you go straight into big sentences from day one, or was it kind of petty stuff that you were involved with? Um, yeah, it was, it was petty. It was, was it? Petty. I think your confidence grows as you do more petty stuff mm -hmm. in, in a wrong way, if that makes sense. So I was like stealing, do you know, like little things and um, smoking weed or hash them times, like, and I don't know, like it's causing stupid shit, smashing things like from young. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, that's how it started. And do then you get in with a similar people that like that similar stuff. Do you think you had anger issues and stuff as a kid? I know you mentioned there with your father not being around. Do you think that had anything to do with why you were smashing things up and acting mm -hmm. the way you were? No, like, because that didn't start till he come back around. So, like, when I was eight, I was like, from, from, when I was young, so eight, I was all right. Like, I might have been a bit boisterous, like, mess about, like, fight with your cousin. Do you know what I mean? Like, nothing, nothing like that. It started when my dad came back around after he got out of prison when I was eight. And then he used to pick me up in, like, stolen cars. And it was a different dynamic. Like, my mum's never been in trouble with the police. Um, do you know what I mean? And he, he was coming in these luxury cars that was brand new at the time picking me up, let me sit on his lap and drive them and and ha having like the old phones when no one really had them then and like beating people up at the lights because they bibbed the horn, jumping out, smacking them up like and battering them and then getting in the car laughing about it. It's like, it was a different dynamic and I think that's when, or oh, I know, that's when the change happened because I started seeing that the only role model of a male that I've had up until then, like, that I've, accepted I'd say was him and then it's negative so it was like you're just learning the bad stuff and I wasn't I don't think when I look back obviously everyone says you're accountable people have gone through shit not gone on to do stuff I get that but I just didn't I didn't I don't think I had the emotional strength them times and the surroundings was like it just it, it just gravitated towards that with that sort of behavior see that's crazy because how did that make you feel as a young lad because I, I, I you know most people don't get introduced you know, to their dad in that light and 
obviously there's people who have fathers and mothers who are like that, but for you as a young lad, when your dad's stopping at the green light and beating people up and that, that's not, you know, it's not the average, is it? So how, how was that matter you feel at that time? Um, I think I don't really, at the time I was excited and it was like, like it was, I don't know, like it was enjoyable. Like I wanted that to be that. I inspired to be that. It was, that's how men, the first man, it's like how we're supposed to act. Do you know what I mean? So I was learning these negative traits and but in, I just, yeah, I don't, I can't really, at that time, I probably just enjoyed that different dynamic. Mm -hmm. What were you told about your dad when he was pulling up in luxury cars and doing all that? Did, did you know he was a crook? No, no just knew he'd been away working. <laughs> was that what it was? Yeah, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but this only was only a small period of time. This was for like two years, but the time was so pivotal because it was from eight till 10. Mm -hmm. And like, I'd, I'd seen this dynamic. So it was like, this is how it is. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was crazy. He was angry, he's emotional. Like, do you know what I mean? He's reckless. He's taking police chases. I remember one time, yeah, I was with my mum and her friend and we're in Tottenham and we're going past and the car that he picked me up with the day before comes flying past, nearly hits the front of our car, yeah. And then the police come behind it and they're like, they're, they're like there's, your, there's your dad. And it's like, it's, if you look fast forward my life, what we get to, it's ironic, isn't it? Like, you become what your, your environment, as they say. So obviously that was a small period of time, but it, it impacted me massively, yeah. I think that's a thing, whether it's good or bad, you, you're going to be massively impacted by the people you're surrounded by, whether it's your friends, parents, doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. And obviously if that's coming from your home or that situation where yeah. the closest people around you are doing these type of madness, like you're going to end up a type of way. Yeah. What's your background, heritage and stuff? Uh, he's Jamaican. Mm -hmm. My mum's English. And I have to emphasise that she's nothing like that. Um, but I just like, I'll shut that, push that away because it's boring. It isn't as fun as what I've just seen. Mm -hmm. So like she, she was always like trying to make me be a good, but I was like, that's boring. Like, and then I'm, I'm around other people similar, my age group that are doing, do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. all the bad kids I was staying with. So I was always just like not listening to what she's saying. Do you know what I mean? So, but yeah, she's English and he's Jamaican. With, with that being your kind of mix, just out of curiosity, obviously I know you're from London. It's a bit, bit different or up here, but, what was that like? Did you ever experience any racism while growing up? Yeah, so later on, my dad goes back to prison. It was on the news. Uh, my mum sat me down. I'm watching Fresh Prince. She's like, you got to watch the news. I watch him go to prison. He gets like a life sentence. And then I've seen him like twice, maybe three times. No, twice the maximum since I was 10 now. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was it. The neighbours changed. They were chasing me, calling me the N-word. So there was some mad rejection there. It was like, I don't know, it just the dynamic changed. And yeah, I, I experienced racism quite a lot because when I, later on, when I moved to Cheson, this, it was not, it was not a multicultural as much as Enfield. And yeah, there was mad racism there. I was like the only one or two black kids around the area. And, mm -hmm. well, even though you mix race, you're still class. Like, do you yeah, know what I mean? And yeah, it's like, yeah, it was just a different dynamic. Do you think when you were getting called the N-word and stuff, do you think a lot of that came from the kind of, <clears throat> I don't want to say hatred because people maybe didn't know your father, but do you think a lot of that came from that? Like, oh, it's his son. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I definitely do. Um, because she used to, the, the, the specific lady that started being like that. I used to go in her house and play with her canaries, like before he was about. Like, and do you know, like, and she'd yeah, let yeah. me in as a kid. Oh, I let him see the little birds and whatever and yeah as soon as he went they were throwing rubbish on the door fucking trying to she was trying to fight my mum one time her partner come down with a knife which like the luckily and I say this now like, I was only like 11 and the uh, police turned up luckily because he was what are you going to do she, like stab me and my mum at 11 it's mad like all because of his actions it's, uh, yeah it was, it was crazy but we got out of there in the end it's crazy to see that even up until this point in the story, it's crazy to see how much of a whirlwind that you've had to go through at that age. I mean, at that point, I know you've never saw your dad, obviously, for that many years. And the podcast's not about your dad. It's about you, mate. And I think that 
the reason I ask those questions, and I know they're quite personal, like, yeah. but I think that we need to paint that picture because ultimately there's a lot of people who will say, well, Chris, you should have took accountability. Why would you have to go and do X, Y, and Z? But I also believe that if that's all you've seen and that's all you know, how else are you going to react when something kicks off? Yeah, it's, e it's easy to say that, but there, there is some tremendous people that have probably been through worse than me and never gone on to be horrible or use it in a hostile way or treat people in horrible ways, yeah, or commit crimes. And and I commend them, but that must have took some support that I didn't have. That must have took some, like, counselling. It must have took some guidance. There must have been someone there that they let in to help them, support them emotionally to get over that. Or, or, it's, or it's impacted them in other ways where there are, there, there's other health conditions from it do you know what I mean like something has come out mine come out in anger at other people some people yeah. would do it in themselves and condemn themselves I'm useless I'm worthless but that has to come out some way if you go for it you might not go into hurt other people but will you be hurting yourself because of it I took my anger out on other people and yeah there's no right or wrong but um I was probably taking it out of myself at the same time but like some people just don't and they take it out on themselves or it, it was, something will happen or they had the support and got over it. I didn't get counselling. I went to school and it was like, oh, we're going to have to give you counselling. Sat down one session. They said, are you okay? I was like, yeah. It was a lot different then. I'm 39 next month. It's like 29 years ago. I didn't care. Men have to suck it up and roll, roll up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, roll up the sleeves and get on with it. It weren't like it, weren't, it weren't like it is now. Mm -hmm. There was no There was no social media. You couldn't just go and Learn, learn things there's no like AI it was just a lot different and yeah you had to get on with it and my way was just taking it out on other people like and acting out and being insecure and I would say fear of rejection and wanting to fit in and finding belonging and trying to do whatever I can however bad that may be on others to impress the people that I was around you know what I mean And so were you violent in school? Um, with your anger issues or were you more of a class clown attention uh, trying yeah, to deflect the teachers definitely the the class clown like set the fire alarm off and tell the teachers to shut up and throw things and and I think that was a lot again fear like I don't think I don't know if I belong or sometimes if I if you asked me to stand up and talk and that it was like I'd rather be disrupted get chucked out than yeah. actually have Deal the confidence with, yeah. to stand up and talk and it's crazy because that, that was a hard thing to overcome now to what I do now. But, um, yeah, that, that was all from fear and just trying to like, act up to show people. And really, it's like counterproductive, isn't it? Were you, were you good with your hands? Like, could you fight? Or were um, you just explosive and just having a go at whatever? Yeah, I'd have a go. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I lost, I'd grab a tour probably more and then mm -hmm. try and like win. And I would... Yeah, I would do whatever I had to to win. You know what I mean? Regardless of um, <laughs> the like circumstances. What so. did you want to do as a young lad, Chris? For your life? I was lost. I was lost. I was wasn't... prison ever in the plans? I... No, but I was told I was going to go there often. <laughs> well, yeah. That's where you'll end up. <laughs> but I had no ambition. I had no. That was the that was the problem. Like I had no goals, no ambition. Didn't know what I wanted to do, and I think. It's like, like they say, it's like being a ship without a captain, bro. You're just wandering everywhere, hitting into rocks. You know what I mean? Like you, mm -hmm. you don't know where you can. You have no direction, and that was me. Um, and and yeah, I, I had lots of issues, man. I didn't know my self worth. I didn't believe in myself. There was no confidence. There was there was a lot of things that was impacted from that short period of time that I just projected outward, and yeah, it was just a nightmare. What would you say? Other young lads who've kind of had an upbringing like you or certain certain experiences that you've had, how do they find their ambition? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. How do you find your ambition? I, I find it, for me, it's been in the adversity. So, like, what I've been through is now all the mistakes I've made, it's actually become, are they mistakes? It's like a different perspective of it now. Is it, the, is it me learning the skills that I now use to help other people? So. It could be in your adversity. It, it's what it's what makes you feel good, I suppose, isn't it? Like, do you know what I think's crazy about your story? And we'll, obviously, we'll get onto that. But when I look at you now, obviously, you look fit as a fiddle, right? Good shape, good looking lad. 
You've obviously came out of prison. Mm. You're doing unbelievable things in the world. Mm. It's very hard for me and probably anyone watching to understand that you were that type of person who went <laughs> on to do the things you did. But I think with you, and I know it's, it sounds like obviously not saying you should have went to prison at that time or it was always destined for you, but I think you've had to learn the hard lesson to be the person you were. Because if you kind of skirted around going to prison, never ended up there, you might have been that guy who was still fat. You know what I mean? Being a bit of a character on the streets, doing X, Y, and Z. Like, you may not have been the beacon of light that you've came on to be. Do you know what I mean? I think that's... The question I asked you about how do kids find their ambition, what do you think you would have needed at that time to be on the right path? Well, what what helped me is when I met the first positive male role model in my life, like, that I accepted, because... I don't want to disregard, I've had some people in my life, like my granddad, but the, the one that I really, truly accepted because of his dumb things that I only dreamed of doing, like seeing like the success he's hit. Um, I didn't know how I wanted to, I just wanted to be, like, at one point you wanted to be rich, but you don't know, have no ambition how to get there. Mm-hmm. And seeing this guy, he's a wealthy guy and he's putting interest in me and he's helping me and he's gone to Harvard and, and that was like, okay. That and he's believing in me, but mm-hmm. still in believe. That was probably one of the main parts of me turning my life around. So that's why I do what I do. I suppose it's like helping other people see that, like their potential. It's unbelievable, man. I think that's that's the biggest take home from what you've just said. Like, I think young people need to have them role models, regardless. Like, it doesn't have to be a parent because ultimately, you might want to be a millionaire. Your mum and dad might not be one. Yeah. You've got to have people around you who are going to support them dreams, and it's it's easy to say that. But look at what can happen if you don't have it. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think ultimately, like, this is why I love doing the podcast. I get it. Like, I said to you before the podcast, when would me and you ever connect? Probably never in real life. Yeah. But at the same time, I will pass across for this. And hopefully someone can watch that and go, with respect, I don't want to be like what Chris was like. Because yeah. they don't, you, no one wants that. It's yeah. not It's not pretty what you've had to go through. Do you know what I mean? And not not, not condoning the things you've done to get in that position. And, and I would you know, again, out of respect because where you are now and how you've turned it around and there is ultimately victims in the this, this shit that you've been up to. And oh, I think yeah. that's what we've got to look at and think, do you know what? Like none of that needed to happen. Although at the time it probably felt like it needed to, you had to, you know, prove, prove a point. You felt the type of way you were trying to deflect something, you know, you, maybe it was nerves, maybe it was just no confidence, whatever it may be. You had to sort of have them outlets, whether that's violence, anger, no matter what it is, I think that's still a path that you've took. And at the time, in your head, it was probably justified. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of kids who were doing them things. You, you're seeing kids now, mate, running around, even up here, running around with knives and doing stupid shit. And it's like, ultimately, like, where's that going? At the time, you may feel like the man, but but if, you, if you're if in 10 behind the door, mm-hmm. how much of a man are you then? Mm-hmm. Can you be there for your mum? Can you be there? You know what I mean? Like, that, that is the thing. And ultimately, someone like you, this is why it's really fucking important to have people like you on the podcast telling the story. I want to I wanna talk, Chris, about obviously getting your, your big sen- sentences. What was your first experience like in prison? Um, <laughs> so the first time I went to prison was when I was 20, just, just before my 21st. And it was only for something stupid, like I breached, I, I refused to go uh, community service or something like that. They gave me 12, 12 weeks to six. And <laughs> you're in the dock and... You know when they leave you to last, there's a potential you're going to go because they, they don't want to hold you in the cells for longer than they need to. They call you in and you go behind the glass. When they call you behind the glass, other times you just get called into the courtroom and they won't put you behind the glass because you know they know they're not going to send you out. But sometimes when they put you behind the glass, it's like there's a potential you could go to jail. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, they put me behind, sent me to prison for 12, 12 weeks. You go, you get, this time I hadn't had my accident, so you handcuff, you're taken down. You get on a sweat box and then you drive to the prison. You don't know where you're going. You don't know who the who the hell you're going to see because um, you're doing all this badness. So now all the bad people are in one place. So you, he's power, her, expert. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. So you could that, be London. You, you could that. either be sweet because you've got people that are around you or you could be in trouble because you've done this to this person and that person's, and, and it's just his cousin and you didn't even know it. And before you know it, something's happening to you. So you're apprehensive because you, you're thinking over these things. You've never been. It's the unknown. You pull up to these gates, they shut behind you and you're on your ones. And I, I think I've said this before. It's like, 
like there's no one with you like you're going in on your own and like you're, you're gonna have to how did you f- how did you feel though because you'd you'd been that guy on the street you'd yeah. been the aggressor so yeah were you humbled no, I, I was nervous I, I, i'd be lying if i said i wasn't and mm-hmm. i think most people at the first time you go you're like whoa and i think it's because of the unknown like you don't know what to expect you You've only heard what people say or seen on TV. Yeah, you don't know about it because you've yeah. never experienced it. Um, so yeah, you you are apprehensive, you are nervous, and then you go in and then you you get through it, and then you're like, huh, is that the worst they got? And that's the saddest part about it. It's like when you do a short sentence, you learn nothing, you do no courses, you've got no real time to reflect on your actions because by the time you get settled and done, you're out in the short ones, and you learn nothing. You come out with more links, more connections, and like the little ones have no impact on was that in a proper prison as well or was it a youth it, offenders it, it was Woodhill and this is like in 2005 Woodhill was like an ACAT then and it had a uh, a YO wing on it so it was it, it had his it had his ACAT status in so, so you'll have been about I was about think I was you 20 or something I was 20 just before my 21st yeah yeah, it was it was a big. Was what a, was your first night like though? Were you, any tears? Be honest. <laughs> no, I don't think I cried, but I was like. You shit. definitely cried, like. <laughs> no, no, I said <laughs> you. Know? I don't think I cried, yeah, but I was like proper shit scared, and I got in the cell, and I'm in with, and they put me in with like a, a I don't know, like someone that was addicted, and it was like, oh shit, this is my reality. Mm. Cells are shit hole, but then obviously <laughs> when you start knowing jail and you're going in. Like they they not, you can't put me in with him. Like I'm not going in. There. I'm not going. I'm not going single. And it gets different. But the first time you're just like, all right, cool. I just take it on the chin. Like you, you don't have that yeah. confidence to say because you don't know that you can get away with what you can do. But yeah, so I was in with this guy, and then in the end, I got moved out of there. It was, yeah, it was. It was, it was not. You're nice laughing because obviously you've given you've given him a good eye, haven't you? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I just told him I got to move out this cell. And they move you, man, like the fucking, it was a shithole. So when you got out, did you think I need to change my life here? What, the first time? Yeah. The same day I was going to pick up drugs, the same day I got out, the first thing I was done was when I got a trim and then when I picked up food and then text everyone in my phone that was in the fucking prison holding box for six weeks, said I'm back. Like it was literally, that's how it went. Why did you, I mean, I get it, but I mean, if I think it was me, I think I'd be like, right, I didn't want to be in that place again. Was it because you found it so easy when you said there, that's the worst I can do? Did you think, well, it's worth the risk? Yeah, I just, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't learn nothing from it. Uh, I just thought it was like, that's it. Like, you've been there. It's, if anything, I made, I think it made me feel more confident to do bad shit. Like I had no, I didn't reflect on anything or deal with anything to do with why i'm doing this stuff because mm. do you know what i mean like i didn't work on my confidence didn't work on self-belief i still had the same things just now knowing that that's the worst you got cool let's what, go but what was your mom like on the first time in prison because yeah, like obviously that's gonna that. break anyone's mother in it no that was hard that was the hardest part about it because she refused to come see me she said i can't come see you lee and 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 leave without you and um I would be on the phone, she'd be crying. It's, that was like, it's like, how, it's hard. But at the time, you're so wrapped up in, I'm the one that's doing it. Like, that's how you're thinking in your head. Like, I'm the one that's in it. You're, you're, you're not, as sad as it is, you, you're you're in a state of like, oh, well, I'm suffering here kind of thing. Yeah, you know it's I mean? you, not her. Yeah, yeah. In, like, obviously you care, it's your mum. But at the same time, you're like, well, I'm fucking, like, you feel like I'm fucking doing it. I'm the one that's locked behind the door. But, yeah, you don't really, really deep the impact on on your family as much. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't at that time, if I'm honest. So how long were you out for before you ended up back in that place again? Um, I think I went back when I was, I got out at 21 uh, and I went back like 27. So you had a decent stint of... <laughs> Yeah, only because I had a massive motorbike accident in between. <laughs> really? Yeah. So <laughs> that probably put me out. I was depressed. I didn't come out of my house for a couple of years mainly. So, yeah. What it, were you doing for money? At that time. The wrong stuff? Not really. I was just sitting in my house depressed. I didn't come out. It was just literally doing nothing. Like I. Did so you have a missus or out? Did you? Well, after the accident. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, like in that period when you came when, up when I came, the first time up to the. Oh, I was straight. I was straight. Well, yeah. I was straight on crime, mm-hmm. but then 
a year later, I lost my arm in a motorbike. And that just changed the dynamic. And is that when you ended up back in? Nah, I didn't go back for that. So yeah. tell us about when you lost your arm in the motorbike, mate. Because again, it's like uh, there's prison and then there's having no arm. Mm-hmm. I think I, I would rather be in prison. <laughs> Obviously not forever, but do you know what I mean? I think I'd rather take that than, than lose a limb. Obviously, you've adapted to life now. But reflecting on that, what happened on that day or that night? So I was, like I said to you, I was active. I was selling drugs. I was with my friend in the pub, um, with two of my friends, and we're drinking. And he gets a call that his missus has crashed the car, hit into a tree with his little daughter in the back. The missus died on the scene. Okay. It was like mad. He went to the, to the scene, obviously. Um, me and my other friend c- carried on drinking. So, in the end of it, I was like, I had a bike outside that was licked, that I was just going about on. And I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to drive it back. And I just drove. Um, And I actually got home. And then someone shouted me, and it was like, literally a a minute drive from my house. So I said, fuck it, I'll go there, quickly meet them, and go back home. Um, I got there, met them, and as I'm pulling off after, then the blue lights come behind me. Mm. And like I heard the siren sounding and I was like dropped the gear, shot off, and I was doing a hundred. The feds behind me and I come to the bend way too fast. The bike started to snick and it like catapulted me flying through the air, breaking beyond the like a fence and went down into a ditch and then I was laying in this stream and the helmet come off everything. The, it was crazy. Um, I was laying in this ditch, I, I punched both lungs, shattered my scapula, broke pelvis, broke vertebrates in my back, stretched the nerves in my leg, had a massive head injury. And I'm looking up and <laughs> the Fed, oh, it was an old school, like from years ago, I went to school with him. And he's like saying to me, don't move. And I'm still trying to get away, laying in this ditch. And then I was in and out of consciousness. And then all I remember is like getting brought up to the top on the stretch of the fireman. And then him asking, I need his blood. He may have been drinking. And then that's it. Next thing I remember, I just woke up out of the coma um, after two weeks being in the Jewish coma. Bloody hell, yeah. Did you When you were lying in that ditch, I know you were in that consciousness, but I know you remember the, the police officer yeah. sort of standing over you. Did you think you were going to die at um, that point? No. That's a good question. Or no, did you want to get up and run? You know I what I mean? I was still trying to get away, but my, like my arm wouldn't come, yeah? And then this stream's running over me and I'm like looking at him, still trying to get, and he's like, it's worse than you think. And I'm like... How did I, he know it was worse? Because now I know I had a massive open fracture, so the bones were sticking out. All right, I'm so. losing loads of blood. I'm, I'm obviously going like... Mm-hmm. The thing. My lungs are punctured. I, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And so he obviously could see the injury was worse, but I'm living off adrenaline. I didn't really think about death at that point if I'm honest yeah. no I don't think so it was like still trying to get away and then then I was just in and out of consciousness and so when you got out that coma after two weeks what what, what was the first thing happened though when you opened your eyes what can you remember I said Billy get me a drink I've got dry mouth <laughs> <laughs> so, man, is that because of all the tubes and all that yeah. and everyone starts crying yeah. well, did you have people like your family in that there, there was there was all there when I brought me out of the coma because they, the head injury was so severe they wanted to say like when he comes round, we'll know if he's brain damaged from mm. what, from how he acts. Because if I was, I no offence, if I couldn't speak or I didn't know no one, then obviously the, the injury, the, the swelling on the brain would have been that severe or whatever it was. Like, it was damage to the brain or the head, whatever. It, that would have been so severe that I wouldn't remember people. So when I said to Billy, get me a drink, everyone starts bawling their eyes yeah, out. Yeah. And I'm like, I want a drink. But they're like, he's not supposed to have a drink. He's Nil by mouth, got to go for another operation. And um, Billy was like, no, nah, he's getting a fucking drink. When, when you said Billy gets a drink, and did, did you see your arm? Yeah. It was was your arm connected to you? Yeah, it was there, man. It was in pins. It was like power, and it stunk like rotting flesh. And like, I couldn't move it. I couldn't... What do you think? It was just broke or something? Well, uh, it was just in pins. I think they left it, if I'm honest. I think they left it because waking up without it would have been too traumatic, I think. I think mm. they knew from then it was never going to be survived. In my opinion, I, they never told me that, but I think 
they was clever enough to know that this is not going to survive. But waking up without it is too traumatic for him. What? Why did you lose it? What was the reason? Because it got sepsis, is what I remember. Right. But I, uh, it got sepsis, and it would kill. It would. He has to go. If the sepsis troubles, it, yeah, yeah, it, it, the poison, whatever it is. So they come to me and they're like, "You gotta sign this paper because they can't just take it off without your permission." I'm like, "No, no fucking way. You got no chance." Um, they're like, "Well." You have to, because we can't let you die. And if you don't sign it, your mum will have to sign it. And it's like, oh, you can't like put that burden on her to sign away your arm, can you? Mm-hmm. So I had to do it. And then you're scriggling the line with the left hand, trying to write a signature. That's just adding to the fucking pain because you was right-handed. And it's just like, shh. yeah, it was, it was, it was a dark place. It was a dark place, but mm-hmm. yeah, because I. Because I looked at it as a dark thing and I was wellering in it. And understandably at the time, it was a traumatic thing that happened. But the way I was perceiving it added to that trauma. Like it was like, couldn't get out of my thoughts. You start thinking you're not worth it. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now you're this, like, who's going to want you? Just, yeah. You're getting all these thoughts. And like people that didn't like me sent me like, you know when they do fake accounts? I think Facebook was a thing then in 2008 and it was like, I think it was like, oh, it might have been M, the one before it, uh, what, MySpace. And they're sending um, messages like, ah, you cripple, like you used to be good looking. Do you know what I mean? And you know, like, I I probably done something that deserved that to them, mm. yeah? But that, that, them ones, I didn't forget it for a reason. Because like it's it's horrible, isn't it? But that's that's probably them thinking it's karma. You, yeah, you can't. Do you know what I mean? Deserved, like, it, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. deserved it. That's what... And it probably was. But if you know it, what? I would think the same, you know? Like, if, if, I, if I was a victim to someone and like I found out they lost their arm, I'd be buzzing. I'd be like, well... Yeah, yeah. But, but I'm... And I'm sure you would, but... <laughs> it's because I'm having the chat with you and I'm not speaking to the victims and, and all the rest of it. And obviously there's probably people who were involved in it that should have been involved as well. Like there's probably times when you've lashed out at people that maybe he's deserved a good hiding at the time. And there's probably other things where it's not everyone's just victims around you, but you know, when you sign to get that arm off, can you remember, I know this sounds mad, but can you remember kind of, did you have a moment where you sell like, I'm going to lose my arm. Like, did you look at your arm and be like, like, can you remember the transition from your arm to then saying, right, we're going through the theatre. When you wake up, you'll not have one type of thing. Yeah, like, I, I remember signing it and then it was qu- pretty quick. It was like the next day because sepsis, they have to act quite quick. And, yeah, I'm just, obviously I was just crying all, all night, feeling sorry for myself. Understandably, I think in that situation, looking at it, just trying not to look at it then looking at it and just yeah just in your thoughts like how am I going to do this I can't live I don't want to live I don't want to be like this like you're a criminal at that time you're active and now you've got one arm like you're you're in a sticky situation like is my thoughts it's like so many things are going through my head you ain't going to get no girls you, you ain't going to I was going to ask that like... you ain't going to be able to uh, like do any career work if you if you was hands on like Everything changing in your head. You think that there's, you, you, yeah, everything's going through your head. And then you go in, crying all the way. Your mum's crying as you go in. Everyone else, I've told him to go. So there's only like immediate family I would let come in the hospital. Um, and then your mum's crying. You get wheeled down and you come out and then it's gone and you, you, you can't. It's just yeah, it was just emotional. And then I feel like at one point I was like, like desensitized, like yeah. I was a separate entity. It wasn't. It wasn't happening to me. It was like I was looking at this happening to someone else. And don't forget, I'm high on morphine. Mm. I'm high on lots of drugs. Like I'm getting the maximum doses of of morphine and all these. You can imagine what drugs I'm on. Um, so that adds to the like the thoughts, the fucking everything. It just intensifies it all, doesn't it? Do you? You know, when you were thinking about like, do I get girls? And and I know that sounds really trivial because that's the last of your worries when you're going through something like that. But I know I would, I would probably think the same and be like, like, you know what I mean? Like whatever you like, there's going to be other things you can't do or, or whatever, or certainly at the time it's like the end of the world. But like, and I know it's easy to say sitting here with four limbs, but it could have been a leg or it could have been both legs or it could have, you could have died. 
And I know that's not, you know, the most positive, but but it could have been. Mm-hmm. That's the truth. And there is people with no, you know what I mean? Like there is people out there. So like, yeah, it's 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 devastating in the in the stuff that you've gone through. But like, there, you know, there, there's got to be some positive. And I th- and I think now because I know kind of what you're doing with your life now, like there is positive in that scenario. I know it would have been really hard to say that at the time, mate. But I think ultimately, like, look, mate, like I've just got to like sort of congratulate you, mate, where you've come because I think it it blows me mind, mate. Like, it's, I've literally got goosebumps talking to you about that because that's just like. I, I get what you mean. And at the time, it was hard to see, but actually, now I could say it was never, it's it's not the arm that would ever hold me back. Mm-hmm. It was the person I was that would mm-hmm. hold me back from getting the girls more than losing the arm. Because where I'm at now, I say the the level of, and I would say like I would get a girl that I probably wouldn't have got at that time. Yo, what's happening, people? If you are liking the episode so far, make sure you click the like button, hit the subscribe button, and also press the notification bell so you don't miss another episode. So when I look back now, it's it's like, yeah, it was hard to see at that time that there are the girls, girls, this, the, the, the things I was thinking about and not getting girls. But actually now when I reflect from the position I'm in now, the arm is less of a problem than the person I was in that sense. So the girls that I, I want to attract, the arm is less of a problem than the person I used to be and the yeah. mindset I used to have. Can I ask, when, obviously, to, to lose that arm, you've, you've took a police chase, effectively, and, and yeah. crashed a motorbike. Were you still getting sort of prosecuted for the crime? Or is it, do they let you off when you've been through something? I know that sounds, is that stupid to say? No. Or they're, or they're almost like, well, the kid's lost his arm, we can't bloody get him done. <laughs> no, the police, the, to the hospital, just after I, I lost my arm and I was in a wheelchair, and I couldn't walk, and that was a problem because of the nerve damage. We never knew if the nerves would ever get the legs back to how they was, so the capability of walking was um, not known at that time. So I'm in a wheelchair. Um, <laughs> and it, that was all good. Trust me, trying to navigate mm. a wheelchair. So I'm trying to... You've gone around and... Oh, <laughs> mate, literally, I said oh, that yeah. before. Like, But you're, you're trying to push your legs, but your legs are not really got the strength. And like you're having to get... Yeah, that was a nightmare. But And then the police turn up, like... The doctor's like, get out of here! Like they're like, no, we got, we got to tell him that he's getting charged for the just driving the stolen bike, whatever, t- planning to stop, whatever it was. Um, and the doctor's like, get the get out of here now! He cannot hear this right this second. Mm-hmm. And they had to go. Um, and then when I got out, got settled. Um, yeah, I went to court, and the judge, the judge said to me, I hope you learn from this. I can't punish you more than you punish yourself. I'm going to give you like a minor, it was like a, he didn't say minor, but it's a conditional discharge where you just go to probation for 12 months. And he said, I'm not giving you that as a punishment. I'm giving you that as support Mm -hmm. Um, because you're going to need it. So learn from this. I don't want to see you in these courts again. And that went in one ear and out the other because at the time I didn't care if you would have sent me to jail. I didn't care if I was alive. Do you know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. so like, I was planning, like not. I wouldn't say planning, but all I thought about was death. Like, so do you think I care if you're telling me, oh, yeah, listen, I wasn't listening to you. I didn't even want to be in your courtroom. So, and probation, that order, they was like, oh, if you feel like coming in, they were really flexible. Like, because I was like, look, like I just said to you, yeah. I don't care if I'm alive, but I'm not coming to your probation office. Like, I've lost an arm. I could end up bumping into someone that I don't get on with. And you, you're dragging me there when I'm trauma. They said, no, look, you ain't got to come if you fancy it. Or can we send someone to your house and talk to you if you want? And if, if you're feeling it. So it was really nothing. Mm. They didn't, they didn't, there was no punishment. And yeah, I, I was just, I just wallowed in self-pity for that two years. I just stayed. I did go out occasionally, but the majority of the time I didn't come out of my house. I, my friends would knock on the door and I'd pretend I weren't in. And like they like, we know you're in, and they're banging on the window, and like I'm just hiding in there. How did how did your friends react to the situation? Like I know that sounds a bit because your friends are your mates, but like were they almost like oh, he's only got one arm now, he's not going to be the same lad? Like or was it? Did they just as if it never happened? Mm, yeah, I think I think that it's a good question. I think they put on a front of yeah, man, you still want to like, but really thought he's fucked, he's finished. Mm. Like, 
fucking hell, he's lost his right arm. How do you think you would you would think? I would think the same. It's like yeah. fucking hell. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't say it to him because you wouldn't want to upset your friend, would you? But you'd, obviously, yeah. if you're thinking, oh, he can't, he ain't gonna be active no more, is he? Who's he giving a right hook to? Do you know what I mean? You'd be, yeah, you'd yeah, be like, yeah. how's he gonna back it when it's when it's on? That's what you're thinking. Yeah, you can't, can't even hardly walk. Like you put a liability to yeah, them if they're doing yeah, the twins, like, don't you? Yeah, hundred percent. Can I ask? Well, I, I think you kind of told us to start with, but I'm assuming your dad never visited you when you went through all that. Nah. He, Was there any he, kind of contact around? Nah. Um, after I, I spoke, after I lost my mum, I spoke to like his side of the family and I was, what, 22? So it was like the first time in 13 years. He was still in prison. He, he, he's, he's probably been in prison nearly 30 years now. Is he still in? Um, from what I know, I think he is, yeah. Like, but I think he's very close to release. So I'm... Li- this is since I was 10, and then uh, this is like nearly... 30 years stretch. Are you, I, do you want to see him again? No, not really. I have seen him. I have seen him. He was at a function, like, not that long ago, and it was just like... Yeah, we had a chat. It, it, it was a stranger to me. <laughs> like, it was a stranger that thought that he was not a stranger. Did he, I mean? did he offer you any comfort, like, especially with the arm situation, seeing his son, surely that would off- trigger some emotions or... No, he no. hasn't got. He hasn't got that in him. He hasn't got. You and you got to understand. Thirty years, you're going to be desensitized from your emotions. You 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 try to do five years. In, I think prison for thirty years. I couldn't imagine. Like we're talking long lines and all these fucking mm. a cap prisons. I don't know what he's been through, but he yeah, he isn't someone that could just. I don't think he can offer that support for myself. I think he needs to work on himself first. You know what I mean? Hundred percent, mate. So Chris, I know obviously you. The kind of probation route. Um, I know you landed a eight year stretch, wasn't it? Yeah, I got, it was ten and a half when I got first no. sentence, and then they reduced it on an appeal because when the judge sentenced me, he said, "I'm giving you ten and a half years extended determinate sentence, which is now EDS, like the new IPP." Right, right. He said, "But you will serve any summing up." He said, "You will serve five year three months." Well, that would be half of the ten and a half. But when you give an EDS, they have to do two thirds. Right. So he fucked. He fucked up. In, he, yeah, he messed yeah, up yeah. in his summing up, um, and that messing up in his summing up is what is what gave me grounds to appeal because when I went in, they said no, you got to do seven out of that ten before parole, and I said, well, he just told me I got to do five and a half. And they said we well, have to appeal it, and then the the court of appeal overturned it, but they didn't put it to a, a straight sentence, which would have been better. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna have a parole. They said okay, we'll reduce it to eight and a half. And you only have to serve the five free or whatever it was. So it was like, so they still try to kind they, of. They still kept me on an EDS, which is an extended license period. So when you get out, if I would have done the five and a half, yeah, the ten, ten and a half, and done five three months, I would get out and I'd have a five year three month license. But when you do an extended sentence, the judge give me an extended license of three years. So you get out. Uh, say say you got a nine, do six, you get out with three, but then you get out with the extra three that he's give you of license. On top of that as well. Yeah, yeah I get that's that. why it's, it's an extended license. It's, it's quite complicated, but... What did you get it, that for? It, for false imprisonment, blackmail, section 20. What's false imprisonment? Is that like taking someone hostage? Yeah, so not letting him out. Um, yeah, just holding him hostage, basically. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Uh, um, I can talk about it, like, as such, like... Uh, like someone so from that depressed mode I think we're missing bits that are probably key to it from that depressed mode I then started going back out around the same people and what happened was I was trying to prove myself again that same kid that was I was from the mm-hmm. from young now fueled with PTSD mad insecurities because I've never really felt that type of insecurity of Oh, you've got one arm, and people are looking at you, and you can't pick up, and you're wearing a prosthetic arm, and it's and you're it's coming off when it gets hot, and it's falling off in your arm, mm. and and like everyone's looking at you, and it's I've never felt that sort of like insecurity. So I started trying to do the same stuff I did before, like the robberies, the the violence, the drug dealing, and then I got into that, and I didn't do no big drugs or anything, but I was had a little doing tickets and had a quite a good ticket line. I had this guy working for me and he, and he took some food and now this guy, honestly, he's the biggest nerd ever. And like, 
he was violating me because of my position now. Mm. And that, that, that's how I felt. Do you know yeah, what I mean? And it was like, like you, you, little, you would have never done that before, but now because you don't fear me and it made me like, I don't know, it made me feel like I had to prove that. Yeah, you, what happened before just I, because I've lost an arm doesn't mean I yeah, can't Yeah, because still... you're taking a violation. Like, I wouldn't mind if you was on it before. Yeah, but you yeah, weren't you on were. it before. Now that it, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, it was, and it just made me go crazy. And then, so you try to get your own back. Yeah, I tried, and I tried to demand my money, and they demand my money back with menace. They say that's the definition of uh, blackmail. And then, yeah, he got stabbed in the in the lower back. Luckily, um, he was all right. And yeah, and then I got Nick for it. Went to court, and my friend was saying the guy, my good friend at the time. <laughs> was saying that he's got him and it's not going to go court and whatever. And yeah, he didn't turn up the first time. I thought, yeah. I thought you were off. I thought I'd walk in. And then they grabbed him, got him and forced him to come. He's behind the curtain. And because he made an original statement after about what happened, mm -hmm. when he was in the court, he was saying, I take a lot of drugs. I don't think Chris did this. I can't remember. Yeah. They're saying, right, cool. You're hostile. Go home. They sent him home. He never come, never, he was behind the curtain, never, never tr trialed him. We didn't cross-examine him, nothing. He went home. What they did is they said, well, because of the hostile witness, fearful of you, because you're, you're this mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, we're going to read his original statement and take you to trial on his original statement. And the judge granted that. Um, the judge was against me, I, I, I believe. And... We couldn't cross-examine him. We couldn't ask no questions. So That just goes to show, though, like, the justice system and all done it because ultimately, like, the whole idea of him to be there was to get... And he's basically, in other words, dropping the charges, isn't he? Yeah, but he was refusing to speak, saying, Chris, I take a lot... Of, all he kept saying is, I take a lot of drugs. Don't think Chris did this. Uh, I can't remember. I take a lot of drugs. And that's all he was saying. And the judge was saying, this guy's scared. And they called it a hostile witness. And, and, and this is a thing I didn't even know. I mean, I'm screaming, like, and this didn't help. I'm going, are you joking? He's saying like, he didn't, I didn't do it. And now you're going to go on a statement. So why would you believe the original statement over the verbal you're getting now? Yeah, and I'm yeah. screaming this in the courtroom and it's like, that didn't help. The judge summed up, said you're disruptive. You showed no remorse. And that's why they, they then the probation come and see me. They put in a report saying that I'm a danger because of the stuff I've been through and the way I'm, I'm dealing with it, I suppose. And and, they're, they're, and they were right on that, the probation. I'll give them that because I wasn't dealing with it well. The judge said, all right, cool, I'm slapping you with a 10 and a half EDS. And then he, luckily, he made the error in summing up. Yeah. So I got it reduced to... Do you know what, though, Chris? Like, I know you said the guy was a nerd or whatever you said, but, like, you know the fact that he said, I just take drugs, I, you know, basically denied it. Mm -hmm. Do you not think, in a weird way, that's you still winning? Because he hasn't did what he could have. He could have really twisted the knife, couldn't he? And, yeah. and piled it on. But he was in the wrong, man. And he's been yeah, to jail true. himself. And oh, he's lived that life. Like, he might not be... So it's even worse. He uh, might be, he shouldn't even be fucking giving a statement in the first place if you're a criminal. Like, yeah, that's nah, how my nah. mindset was at that time. But, like, how am I winning when I just got a 10 and a half EDS? I don't feel winning. <laughs> what was that like then? Because now you're going back into prison with one arm. Did you feel I, like... I've been in prison on remand with one arm and I've been in prison in between that depressed mode to that day yeah. of getting found guilty. I'd been nicked and put on remand and sentenced to... And probably yeah, done, a month or something did you do? I got 15 months for mm -hmm. a stupid train thing. Mm -hmm. And then I also done like three or four times on remand for cases where they just... You get charged and then they remind you for six months, take you to court, and then you either get guilty or not guilty or get time served. So I've done that a few times. If you don't know by now, I run a business called The Content PT. I create content for influencers, PTs, online coaches, and fitness brands all around the world. So if you are someone who's in need for sexy content for your social media, or you really want to maintain a competitive edge in your industry, drop me a DM on Instagram. Familiar with prison by then. I've been, I've been around it. I've been in prison a few times so i i was used to the, the the disability and i would say that i had a a a way of using that against them because mm -hmm. at first i didn't but like you can get a single cell you can there's rules they have to abide by and like equalities acts that they have to follow 
because mm-hmm. they're a government body. And yeah, yeah, once you start and have started boarding the block, reading these things, these they're called PSI, so they're like the laws of what prisons have to do. Mm-hmm. You start reading this, you can say, all right, cool, I want this because I know that's you've got to put this in, and because of this, and you start using it against them, and, and they don't like that. They hate that more than they hate you banging up and like fighting them and being disruptive because yeah, they can just cool. wrap you up, put you in the block. But when you're saying, all right, cool, I got one arm, you got to do X, Y, Z. Um, you got to facilitate this. Oh, you got to make this adaption because that's for my needs of my... They're like, oh, this one's a problem. Get rid of him. Because, rid of you, yeah, <laughs> because it's that. it's just headache. They just want cattle. Well, Chris, to... how, how the fuck... Like, how have you not... How have you not learned, though? That's what I didn't, that's what I didn't understand. Yeah, that, like, yeah, that... And the thing is, right, what I, what I will say is I think there's certain types of people and I think there'll be re-offenders who just go out, they're just dickheads. I yeah. do believe there are them, them people. But with you, it's almost like... I'm not trying to justify what you've done, but... Nah. It's almost like I can still sense that kid in you. Like you've always had that thing to prove. And, and it's, yeah. I feel like it's just a shame that you've had to redo that to prove a point or to try and prove yourself or you're confident or even though I've got one arm, I can still do this. And it's like, I never learned. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's just got to be another way for people who have gone through this. Like, surely it's not like, I don't know, mate. I think that's what I'm thinking. I, I think it's just a shame the fact that, because I can sense that. Like, and I know you've done some horrible shit, mate, but like, I don't know. It, like it's almost like I can see the sensitive side of you. Like yeah. that's what's weird when I'm with you now. I mean, yeah. I, mate, you could walk out of here and do a madness today. No, I wouldn't, no. but I, but I just don't. But like I feel like for you to be that way, you'd have to be egged on to kind of like, all right, fair enough. I'm gonna be the guy now. Yeah. But you as a person, I didn't think you really liked that deep down. No, I don't. I don't think I was. I think it was like the environment. It was trying to prove to others that I am that, seeing bad things, and then just. Being around the summer people that are doing the same shit and it's like, that's it. That's all you know. You get wrapped up in it and before you know it, it's like, it's what we do. Like, it's, it's, that's, that's your mindset. You're trapped in this. And you, and the one thing I, I never learned from, I was not learning from all these mistakes I was making. I was just like looking at them like badges of honor, like stupidity. Like I wasn't, yeah, I was, I, I just didn't learn and just kept staying with the same people doing the same shit. And it wasn't until, like I said to you earlier, when someone see the value in me that's actually got money, he's successful and saying, what? he's like laughing at me, like, what are you doing? Like, this, where's this going? He's like, why are you doing it? I said, for money. He's like, this is not money. Yeah. Like, exactly. this is not money. What you're doing is not money. And he's like, like, things he was saying to me made me think a lot and he was very clever. He's a very intelligent guy. And it's just, really brought out that thing of me, like, actually, yeah, I can do this. I can be this. He's like, look, you can be doing speaking. You can be, sharing that you could be a keynote speaker you could be on the lecture circuit you could be changing people's lives you could be doing this you could uh, it all started from letting him read my that book that i read that was kind of therapy and he's like you could have this you could like why what are you doing like, what what is the purpose of this and he's like you want to be an author i was like yeah eventually one day i want to share the story he's like oh do you read i'm like no he's like what author what author don't read like read and, read, read and then yeah. read the dictionary while you're reading it and learn the words because your vocabulary is terrible and it was like because mm. i'm speaking all hood and he's like these are things you need to work on right now and i and he's like i want to sit and he's holding me accountable i want to see that show me that you're on it and like i was like in a computer room every day with andrew pritchard and and that he, he was writing his book and i'm writing mine and this guy sam is like pushing me and he's like yeah, like that that instilled something, and it was just them things there, like holding me accountable. Like, and he's like, "I'm I'm proud of what you've done," and he's like saying, "Do you know what I mean?" Saying these things that I I didn't really hear often, and I mean, te- you needed that, like teaching me that Chris, your value is in what you've been through, and and you can be so much value. You can start a movement, like you can be this, and he's like, I, "You're wasting it for something that is nothing." And so- where are these people now? He's like. Where are all these friends? Exactly. Like, where's that life? Who's got you now? Where Where are your customers from before? Uh, and, and and he was right, wasn't he? Like, he, he was bang on. Now. He was, and I think people need to hear this. But yeah, what what are what? Who is Chris Baker now? Like, what do you want to do? Because obviously, you're writing books and you're doing again, I, I, you're doing all this stuff to inspire people. The podcast, you're telling your message, you're spreading the word. But what are you about now? So the books on hold, really, at the moment. I've been working on. A program that we're going to get into schools that teaches kids to be a bit more resilient, I would say, and mindset, which is based on that perspective on outlook. 
I'll give you an example. Like when I lost my arm, my mindset was all, oh, this is the worst thing. I can't get girls. I'm this and that. And it's like when I actually now look at it, like, yeah, all them things, all them mistakes I went through, all them things I've done were terrible at the time. But were they what I needed to learn the skills I am now to help people? That's just a twitch in perspective. It's not, nothing's changed. It's just the way I see it. And I think we need to help them in schools with that. Um, and yeah, we're working on that program and that's, that's, that's going to be coming soon. Um, I also work with a charity called DBA. Um, I do some work with Andrew's AP Foundation, Curse the Arts, and that's a lot of mentoring and speaking, which again, I had to go to a learning thing for two years to learn how to speak because I was petrified because I thought I had no value and people were going to judge me and I, I can't stand up in front of people. Done that. Uh, Toastmasters and then I end up in, in a competition this year and and I went all the way to like you go from your club to area to division to, to district and I got to this district out of like loads of whole of England and, and, and Ireland and I come second out of all that so it's like that was like another thing of like yeah you put the work in for two years now you can help people and it's just like that was massive for me because I've been speaking to kids and that, but that just showed that even in a setting of them, pe the people that I was competing against are not, they're all like corporate business people. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. To, to, to get some show value in, up against them, that shows you actually that you have got value in your message. And I think uh, that's what any kid or anybody watching or listening to this can take from that as well. I feel like ultimately, regardless of your skill set, your background, who you know, your circle, whether you've been in crime, whether you've been to prison, whether you've hurt people, no matter what, mate, anyone can change and do that thing. Do you know what I mean? But you have to change your environment and the people you surround yourself with. Because if you're in a negative environment, it's very hard to be positive. Well, get this. So get very. this, right? I've seen something just today. I've got to see it, right? Someone posted a, I think it was an Evian bottle of water. And he went, this in your local shop's 80 pence. But in an airport, it's 250. In a nightclub, it's six quid. And he was like, it's the same bottle of water. But if you change your environment, the actual thing changes. And that exactly what you've just said there, like ultimately, if you surround yourself by different people, the value that you can get, your value isn't changing. It's always been there, but you can get it to certain people down certain avenues, whether it's a pod, like, were you thinking about doing a podcast when you were taking that bike chase? Definitely. Mm. Do you know yeah, what I mean? And yeah. then now, because you've did what you've did, I think this is what you've got to go through. And I just feel like, I, I want to just say thank you again, mate. I wish we had more time to, we're definitely going to have to do a part two, mate, if you're up for it. I'll, obviously, I'll come down to London, we'll get it done, but... um. I just want to, I just want to say thank you so much, mate, for sh for being vulnerable, sharing your story, and I think that this, we're just scraping this story, man. There's okay. so much I want to deep with yeah. this because I feel like there's just so many people that can take some value and be benefited. Like if I'd watched this when I was younger, like, oh mate, like this is it could it could it could help someone, hundred percent. Yeah, and I think um, people need to be vulnerable because actually, what I've learned is vulnerability is. And this is from like reading a lot of books and vulnerability is actually the birthplace of courage as Brene Brown says. It's like, tr how can you ever be courageous without being embracing vulnerability? It's not possible because by definition you can't. So I think people have this ring about vulnerability as like it's some weakness or you shouldn't do it. Or, do you know what I mean? It's your biggest strength. And, and yeah, and, but a lot of people don't see it like that still even now today. And yeah, I think it, you you have to lean into that to actually grow and change things. Where which I'm, sorry, mate. Go on. Which, one, which I'm learning. Yeah and, yeah. and it's and it's a continuous journey. Like I'm learning day by day that things will still come up and I'm like, right, that, I need to work on that. And it's just ever going. But as long as you're on that healing journey, then you're not stagnant and you're growing, isn't you? But if you're yeah, sure. if you're not part of that healing journey, then like that ever going healing journey, then you're you're just not you're not moving, you're not evolving. Whereas I think a lot of people are gonna take a message like this and not apply what we've talked about, not apply that you can change, yeah. and just take it as an entertainment. But if you actually apply it, you can get somewhere. And I think that's this has definitely been one of the most valuable podcasts I've did in terms of what we've given to the people. I think there's for a young lad or girl who's listened to this and who's maybe is about to do some madness or whatever. I think that like use you as an example because it doesn't just end in prison it can end in a whole lot worse yeah but even if you have been down that road and you're thinking about doing it again it can even be better mate but um chris thanks a lot for your time mate. where can yeah. people find you actually mate yeah on social instagram um I, I suppose you put the link in but it's chris baker double underscore 
um, on most platforms. Perfect, man. Thanks a lot for your time, Chris. No, no, thank you for having me. Peace, man.